from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want to take as our text tonight a passage in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. These words. And this word yet once more signified the removing of all those things that are shaken as of things that are made, but those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Since we were here in the 50s and then in the 60s, things have changed. I was asking Joe Ulrich a moment ago, I said, don't you all still have streetcar antibiotics before nylons, before Xerox, before credit cards? For us, time sharing meant togetherness, not computers. And software wasn't even a word. We were before pantyhose and drip dry clothes, before ice makers and dishwashers, Cheerios, instant coffee, decaffeinated anything, and, Mac and McDonald's had never been heard of. And I don't know how we lived. If we'd been asked to explain CIA, VCR, UFO, ERA, NFL, or JFK, we, we would have said, well, that's alphabet soup. <laughs> when you think of how our world has changed and the adjustments we've had to make, today's senior citizens are a pretty hardy bunch because we came along through all of that. <laughs> there have been great political changes. Hungry. We were in the People's Stadium in Hungary about three or four years ago and it had the largest crowd in its history to hear the gospel. 115,000 people in one service. South Africa would have never thought of having an integrated service in those days. We went to South Africa. We did not go until they guaranteed we could have integration. And we went there. And we can show you on film where the newspapers had headlines saying, Billy Graham says apartheid is sin. And uh, then there have been gigantic geophysical and ecological calamities across the world. I read last Sunday's Earth Week column in the Argonian, a diary of some of the things that happened on the planet last week. It talked of tropical storms last week, like the worst hurricane to slam into Hawaii in this century. It continued to report on the damage from Hurricane Andrew in Florida. Norman Mitski's house, who is on our team, uh, looked like some giant hand had come down and just lifted the whole thing up and lifted everything out. We went to Homestead in southern Florida. And my son, who's here tonight, Franklin Graham, has an organization called Samaritan's Purse. And they had already gotten 10 trailers in place down there by the time we got there to see it. And what a devastation that was. You cannot imagine what happened in Southern Florida. You can't see it on television. Stefan Nelson, my grandson, spent his full time down there working, handing out water and bread and uh, things. And he saw on top of one roof this sentence that somebody had written. Okay, God, you got our attention. Now what? And the newspaper went on to mention Typhoon Sybil, the tropical storms, Payne and Roseland. Monsoon floods washed away entire villages in North India and Pakistan, killing thousands of people. There were earthquakes in Zaire and Nicaragua and minor shakes in many other parts of the world. These are just the things that came out of one newspaper. This is all in addition to environmental changes such as the sudden drop in levels of protective ozone over the Antarctic mentioned in the column, 
that might signal major damage. I could go on and on. And that was just in your newspaper last week. We are living in a changing and increasingly dangerous world. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's not getting better. Do you have a purpose in your life and does life have meaning to you? Or is your life cracking up and going all to pieces? The big question today is, what is meaning? Fifty years ago when I started preaching, the philosophical question was, what is truth? Today's question is, what is the point? The Bible says the heart is deceitful, above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your heart, my heart, is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who would believe that after a storm hit Miami and southern Florida like Andrew, that there'd be looters taking advantage of it? I read an article in the Charlotte Observer last week that domestic violence cases are soaring after the hurricane in southern Florida. We don't know our hearts. We don't know what would happen until it actually happens. Andrew Morris, the great philosopher in France, wrote, the universe is indifferent. Who created it? Why are we here on this puny mud heap spinning in infinite space? He said, I have not the slightest idea. And there are many people that take that attitude. Albert Camus, who was the great philosopher that everybody quoted a few years ago, said, man cannot live without meaning. Are you trying to live without meaning in your life? Now here are some of the things that the philosophers were saying that people think about when they're alone. When you're alone, here's what many people that are here tonight think about. First, you think about, well, I have to suffer. Maybe now or soon. I must struggle to make ends meet. I must struggle in my marriage. I must struggle with my girlfriend, my boyfriend, because it seems that things are going wrong. I must struggle to make grades in school. I'm at the mercy of chance. I feel guilty all the time and I don't know what I'm guilty of. I ask the question when I'm alone, who am I? I know that I must die and I'm afraid to die. I don't want to die, but I know I'm going to have to die. Every person in this audience 75 years from now will be dead. A scientist recently asked the question on television, who made the earth? Why is it here? What is its future? We have the answer. We just don't know. Then he said an interesting thing. Perhaps we're all going to have to restudy the biblical accounts. And that's exactly what many atheists are doing today. They're restudying the biblical accounts. The first time I met Mr. Yeltsin in the Kremlin, I talked with him and he told me that he'd been an atheist. But he said, I'm no longer an atheist. He said, I've come to believe that there's something beyond this life and something bigger than we are. And he said, I've started going back to church. And he said, my grandchildren are wearing crosses around their necks and I'm glad. Now that was a couple years ago before the coup. <laughs> T.S. Eliot once wrote, where is the wisdom? Think of it now, where is the wisdom that we've lost in knowledge? We have a tremendous amount of knowledge. We have universities by the scores and hundreds and thousands throughout the world. but we've lost wisdom in the midst of all of our knowledge. Jesus said, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. 
in Luke 21, 25. Distress, that word means that we're pressed from all sides. And perplexity means no way out. If you'd gone to Rio to that conference on ecology and how can we save this planet, you would have come away like many of them came away, confused and mixed up, discouraged and hopeless. President Kennedy said a quarter of a century ago, no man entering upon this office could fail to be staggered upon learning the harsh enormities of the trials through which he must pass in the next few years. How right President Kennedy was. He went on to say, each day the crisis multiplies, each day their solution grows more difficult, each day we draw nearer the hour of maximum danger, and time is not our friend. In the midst of all these changes, there are certain things that have not changed and will never change. The first thing that has never changed in all these centuries, the nature of God has not changed. He said, I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi 3.6 The scripture says there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning with God. That means the batting of an eyelash. Not even that much change in God in all these centuries. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He had no beginning. He has no end. I don't understand that, but I accept it. He's the one thing that we can count on is God. He's unchanging in his holiness. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is, is and is to come. Revelation 4, 8. God is unchanging in judgment. It says the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. God is unchanging in love. For God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you. That's hard to believe, that's hard to take in, but God loves you. And if you were the only person in the whole world, God would love you and we, he would have sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you. God is love. That's one thing I want you to remember when we leave, that we've said. And then the second thing, the word of God has not changed. Not only the nature of God has not changed, but the word of God has not changed. This Bible, is the word of God. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And what you read in this book stands forever. It's a thrilling thing to take up this book and know that you are reading something inspired by God and it's his message to the human race. He tells us where we came from. He tells us where we're going. He tells us how to live every day. The third thing that hasn't changed, human nature has not changed. Jeremiah the prophet said, as I said a moment ago, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. Sin means that I've broken God's laws. I've broken the Ten Commandments. If you have broken one commandment one time, you're guilty of all. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever had lust in your heart? Then you're guilty. We're guilty before God. And because we're guilty, we're under sentence of death. Death in this life and death in the life to come. The way of salvation has not changed. In all these centuries, the way of salvation is still the same. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved, in Acts 4.12. John 14.6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. In the last generation, the only way to God was through Christ. In this generation, the only way to God will be through Christ. 
the only one in history of whom it is written, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Think of it. The wrath of God abides on you now. And the only way that wrath can be turned away is by the cross. When Jesus Christ took your sins on the cross, God could no longer see your sins because your sins were buried in the depths of the sea. And God cannot even remember your sins. Think of it. God cannot even remember. He has the ability to turn the tape recorder off and erase it. And God cannot remember your sins when you come to Christ at the cross by faith and repentance. Yes, God will never change. The Word of God will never change. But you have to change if you are to go to heaven. If you are to have a, a new life here and have purpose and meaning in your life, you have to change. The first thing you have to do is repent. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, the scripture says. The second thing is to believe, and that word believe means to commit. That's the marriage vow that we take. It's not just getting married, it's a lifetime commitment. My wife is here tonight, and she... Uh, And uh, we've had differences, like every normal couple. And someone asked her, had she ever thought of divorce? She said, no, but I have thought of murder. <laughs> I don't know where she's sitting, but sometime I'm going to ask her to explain that. But we have a wonderful marriage and we have a wonderful family and all of them know the Lord for which we give thanks to God. Now I want to ask you, do you know Christ? You see, Christ died for you. And on that cross, God laid on him the sins of us all. We deserved hell. We deserved judgment. We deserve to pay the price for our sins, but Jesus took them voluntarily on the cross. And on that cross, he had the capacity because he was the God man to see you sitting here tonight. He looked ahead these thousands of years and he could see you and he knew you and he knew all about you and he loved you and he's willing to forgive you and give you purpose and meaning in your life and change your life. Your life has to change. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you come to Christ? Has there been a time when you received him as your Lord and your Savior and said, Lord, with your help, I want to follow you. I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to pray and I'm going to be as faithful to you as I can. I can't live the Christian life alone. I'm a failure. Billy Graham cannot live the Christian life. I've tried. I can't do it. But with the help of the Word of God and the help of the Holy Spirit, I can live the Christian life. But He lives it through me. He produces the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, and joy and peace. All of these things are supernaturally produced in you by the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ. Some people say, I'm trying to hold on. You don't need to hold on. He holds you. Just turn loose and let Him come into your heart. How many of us, we've been baptized? We go to church once in a while, maybe every Sunday. 
But deep in your heart, there's a doubt that you know Christ. You're not sure that if you died at this moment, you'd go to heaven. You want to be sure. You want to be certain. You want to know that your sins are forgiven. And you want to know that purpose and meaning that God can give to you. Are you willing to change your way of living? That's repentance, to change your mind, to change the direction of your life. And you can't repent by yourself. The Holy Spirit has to help you do that. And then you come by faith, and faith means commitment. When I stepped on this platform last night, I'd never been on this platform before. I didn't get down and examine it to see if it would hold me up. I accepted by faith that the carpenters that built it, built it to hold a man. And by faith, you receive Christ in the same way. You totally commit yourself. You say, Lord, I'm not trusting anything else to save my soul except Jesus. I commit myself to Him. Young people today are looking for a cause. They're looking for a flag to follow. They're looking for something to really believe in. People are mixed up. They're confused. They don't know what to think. They're just angry. And many people think, can we hold together as a society? Come to Christ. He will meet all those longings and all those needs and give you a new life. He can come into your family. He can come into that office where you've been having trouble. He can come into your schoolroom. He can come into every phase of your life and make you a new person. He can make those ends meet. He can help you meet those payments. He can help you in looking for a job. He can give you total assurance that your sins are gone and that God will never hold you accountable for them again. They're forgiven. And He receives you with open arms and he'll do it tonight if you'll let him. And I'm going to ask you to do something we saw hundreds of people do last night. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want Christ to come into my heart. I want him to take all of me. I surrender my life to him. And I say, Lord Jesus, I am willing to repent of my sins and turn by faith to you and put my total confidence and my total faith in you. He died on the cross and shed his blood for you. And certainly you can come and take a stand here for him. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. That's the reason I... From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I want to turn tonight to the third chapter, the second chapter of John's Gospel, beginning with the 23rd verse. The second chapter of John's Gospel, beginning at the 23rd verse. Now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now when you hear about Christ and all the great things that he did, you may believe in him. But Jesus knows your heart, and when he sees your heart, he will not commit himself to you. Now the question I want to ask is, has Christ committed himself to you? Because your heart has been cleansed of sin. Then it goes on into the next chapter. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Now in America, a few years ago, we had a president 
who announced that he was a born-again Christian. And so that word became identified in some ways in our country with politics. And then we had uh, advertisements that advertised born-again automobiles, motor cars. Then we had cities that sprung up and they said born-again cities. And then they had writings come along that said born-again books. And that brought confusion, but this literally in its original language means born from above. It's born anew. It's a new beginning. And I want to ask you, have you ever longed to start life over? Or like the psalmist, have you ever said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me? Have you ever thought to yourself, I'd like to start it all over again? Now Nicodemus, who came to Jesus, had been in that crowd that Jesus would not commit himself to them. He knew their hearts, and he knew that they had never been born again. And Nicodemus was one of them, and he was a great religious leader. And he came to Jesus at night, and he wanted to ask some spiritual questions. Now, he was not only a great religious leader, but uh, he, he did many things that you and I don't do in his religion. And he wanted to have some more thought before committing himself. Now, many of you have thought a long time about religion and Christianity, but you're not sure that you've been born again. A famous scientist came to see me some time ago. And he said, Mr. Graham, he said, my home is a wreck. I'm a secret alcoholic. I've come to you for help. If I don't find help, I'm going to commit suicide. I've had it. The pressures are too great in my life. It was a desperate cry of a man that needed God. He needed to be born again. We live in the mountains in the southern part of the United States of North Carolina. George Hamilton lives a short distance from us. And there was a mountain man near our home who got lost in the mountains. And he knew those mountains very well, but he was lost and he stumbled onto a mountain cabin. An old man gave him some advice and said, when you find yourself lost in the mountains, never go down, always go up. At the top of the ridge, you can get your bearings and find your way again. Now we can become lost in the mountain of life. And we have two choices. Either go down and get caught in depression, emptiness, confusion, turn to drugs or alcohol or whatever, or we can keep heading up. We're going one way or the other. Now searching is important. Searching for purpose and meaning in your life, for psychological and philosophical questions. But it no, does no good unless you search in the right place. And the right place is to search in the Bible, the Word of God, and come to Jesus. I heard about a 10-year-old boy that was writing a thesis and uh, he went to his grandmother and he was writing on birth and he said, Grandmother, how were you born? And she said, a stork brought me. She went to his mother and he said, Mother, how were you born? She said, a stork brought me. Then he said, well, how was I born? She said, a stork brought you. And he started his thesis this way. There hasn't been a natural birth in our family in three generations. Now the scripture says we're to be born again. And how do you become born again? What does that mean? Nicodemus must have been stunned if Jesus had said it to Zacchaeus, the crooked tax collector, or the woman at the well who had had five husbands and the man she was living with was not a husband, or the thief on the cross that was certainly guilty, or the woman that was taken in immorality, but to say it to a religious leader. Nicodemus was a ruler. He was rich, he was religious, but he was searching for reality. Now he fasted two days a week. He spent two hours daily in prayer. He gave 10% of all of his income to this temple. He was a professor of theology. He worked hard at religion. But Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, that's not enough. You must be born again if you're to even see 
the kingdom of God. Now, why did Jesus say this? Why did he say you must be born again? Because he knew what was in the hearts of people. What causes lying, cheating, hate, prejudice, greed, injustice, selfishness, cruelty, jealousy, perversion, ultimately war? What causes it? Jesus said those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile a man. Now, psychologists and sociologists and historians realize that something's wrong with the human race. What is it? What's wrong? The Bible tells us. The Bible says the thing that is wrong is that we have a disease. It affects the whole human race all over the world, and the disease is called sin. Notice I said sin, singular, and from the singular, which is the disease, come all of the sins of jealousy and hate and lust and greed and all the rest, which ends up in war, war in a community, war in a family, war in your own heart, war in the world. Now, where did this sin come from? This sin came from the fact that God created you in His image. You have a body, but living down inside your body is your spirit, your soul. And that's the part of you that can have fellowship with God and did have fellowship with God. And God said that if you will obey me and serve me and live for me, we'll build this wonderful world together. But man broke God's law. Man rebelled against God, and his first child was named Cain, and Cain became jealous and killed his brother Abel. That was the beginning of all the wars of history, and that sin that was in Cain's heart that he inherited from his mother and father, Adam and Eve, has been passed from generation to generation to generation to generation down to you and me. All have sinned, the Bible says. Everybody is sin. Billy Graham is a sinner. You are a sinner. And sin is very serious in the sight of God because the result of sin, the penalty of sin is death. Physical death, we all know about. But it's spiritual death. You can be alive right now physically, but your soul is dead. Your spirit is dead and you keep searching for something and you can't find it. You don't know what it is. You can't find it in money. You can't find it in drugs. You can't find it in sex. You can't find it in all of these other substitutes. You'll never find what you're looking for in life till you come to the cross of Christ and are born again. Now, there are many words used in the New Testament to describe sin. It means a breaking of God's law. It means coming short of God's requirements. All unrighteousness is sin. Even the most perfect of us, like Nicodemus, a great religious leader, we're all sinners. You see, the Bible says that we're born with this tendency to sin. Then we come to the age of accountability and we choose to sin. And then we become sinners by practice. And then our hearts get harder and harder and harder the older we get. That's the reason when God speaks to you, when you have an opportunity like this where thousands of people have prayed and worked and you are here, you better make your commitment to Christ tonight. You may never have another hour like this as long as you live. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So what is needed? A radical change is needed in every person to find true or real fulfillment in this life to be acceptable to God, to enter God's kingdom. Nicodemus wanted to go to the kingdom of God, but in order to get there, Jesus said, you're going to have to be born again, born from above. Something supernatural is going to have to happen in your heart. So what is this business of the new birth? Nicodemus asked that question. He said, how can a person be born when he's old? He wanted to understand it intellectually. The Bible says that the preaching of the cross is foolishness. Foolishness. Idiotic. There's no way 
that our little finite minds can understand all there is to know about the great God who is from everlasting to everlasting. And there's no way that we can understand all that happened at the cross when the Jesus Christ died and said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Bible tells us that God at that moment was laying on him all of our sins, all of our hell, all of our judgment. He took it on the cross. So how do we find it? We cannot come intellectually alone. Now, there are a lot of things that I don't understand. I was watching some cows graze today out in the country. And I don't understand how a black cow can eat green grass and produce white milk and yellow butter. But they do. I don't understand color television and satellites way off yonder in space. I don't understand how Neil Armstrong put his foot on that moon. I know Neil Armstrong and have talked to him and asked him how he felt and he's told me. I don't think he understands it either. Or the satellites, or the computers. I have a computer. A man this past January gave me a computer, a very fine computer. So I was taking some lessons and trying to learn how to work that computer and just about to lose my mind. And uh, so I decided I would write a letter. When I learned to write a letter, I wrote a love letter to my wife. And I lost it in the computer. <laughs> and I couldn't find it. And I was afraid that somebody else may find that letter. I didn't even want, I didn't even want my secretary to find that letter. It's still lost. And the computer is locked up at home. Nicodemus could see only the physical and the material, and Jesus was speaking about something spiritual. He had already been born physically, but he had not been born spiritually. You have to be born twice, physically and spiritually. Now, you can't inherit it, and it's not by works, not by works of righteousness, which we've done according to his, but according to his mercy, he saved us. You can reform yourself, but that's not it. You can take a pig, put him in your living room and put a ribbon around him, give him a good bath, put some Chanel number no. five on him, open the door and find out what happens. The pig goes back to the mud hole. His nature hasn't been changed. Or you cannot imitate Christ. People say, oh, I try to imitate Christ. I live by the Sermon on the Mount and the Golden Rule. Isn't that good enough? No, that's not good enough. Ezekiel says, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. The Apostle Paul sp speaks of being alive from the dead. In 2 Corinthians, he calls it a new creation. Old things pass away and everything becomes new. In Peter, Peter says, being partakers of the divine nature. John calls it passing from death unto life. The new birth brings about a change of heart, a change of spirit that influences our way of thinking, our way of living, our attitudes, as well as our actions. It determines our destiny. How is it accomplished? Jesus said it's a mystery. He said it's like the wind. You can see the evidences of the wind. The wind is blowing, but you can't see the wind itself. And there's the analogy of natural birth. You see, there's the moment of gestation, of, uh, pardon me, of conception. Then there's the months of gestation. Then there's actual birth. And with many of you, you might have had conception, or you may be in some stage of gestation, but you haven't been born yet. And you need to be born. And how does that happen? The Bible tells us, first of all, there must be the reception to the Word of God. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Now, doesn't it sound strange and foolish to you that a man can stand up here? and talk about Jesus Christ and your life can be changed by that message? Isn't that foolish? Well, that's what the Bible says about it. It's foolish. 
That's the reason you come by simple childlike faith, as we heard a moment ago, like a little child. Jesus said, unless you come as a little child and be converted, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And then it's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts us. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, the Bible says. You cannot come to Christ unless you are made uncomfortable by the Holy Spirit and he shows you that you've sinned. You cannot come to Christ unless he draws you to the cross. And he may use a mother's prayers. He may use a tragic experience. He may use the sermon of a clergyman, or he may use the example of some wonderful person that you know. Or maybe he'll use a little tract of some sort that somebody gives out. I remember the meeting the Surgeon General of Portugal and he told me that he was walking down the street one day and he picked up a piece of paper on his shoe and when he got to his house, he took the piece of paper. Often it was a little tract on how to find Christ. And he said he had never read anything like that in his life. And he read it, and he studied it, and he read it, and he studied it, and got him a Bible and studied some of those verses. And he was born again. And he became a Bible teacher. He became a wonderful proclaimer of the gospel just through the reading the Word of God. It gives new life. The Bible says that we're dead in sin. And you hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sin. Man needs new life. He needs to be born from above. And the moment you give your life to Christ, he indwells. And I will put my spirit within you. The scripture says, he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. When you leave here tonight, after you've received Christ into your heart, you don't leave alone. We sang that song when we come in the Shankly Gates every night. There's that little inscription that says, you'll never be alone, you'll never walk alone. Christ goes with you. The Spirit of God goes with you to help you to live the Christian life. There's nobody here, including me, that can live the Christian life. I cannot live it. It's too much for me. But Christ can live it through me, and he can give me the strength to produce by the Holy Spirit love and joy and peace and long-suffering and all the fruit of the Spirit? Know you not that you're the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, the Bible says? He gives you a new power in your life, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Power to love, power to resist the temptations in life. In Wakefield, England, some time ago, I read about a woman who tried her driver's test for the 38th time and failed. And perhaps you've tried nearly that many times for a license spiritually to sit in the driver's seat of your own life. I'm asking you to move over and trust the Holy Spirit to drive and control your life. Do you know Christ? Are you sure? God can give you a whole new life, a transformation that you never dreamed existed if you let him. You see, when Christ died on the cross, he died for you. And God says, I'll forgive your sins. I'll give you eternal life. You can start life all over again, even if you're 70 years of age or 100 years old. But come while you're young. If you're a young person, you ought to run to Christ. Because you see, the Bible says, remember now thy creator on the days of thy youth. The Bible calls young people especially to come to him. What will he do for you? He'll forgive every sin you've ever committed. He'll give you eternal life. You're born into his kingdom. That means that if you died at this moment, you'd go to heaven. Then what do you have to do? Christ died gave his life for you, what do you do? You respond by first repentance. What does repentance mean? The word repentance means to change, to change your way, to change your mind, to change your way of living, to let Christ come and help you become a new person. And the second thing you must do is come by faith. 
Remember I said you cannot understand it all intellectually? You come by simple childlike faith like a little child trusts its father or mother. And then thirdly, you must be willing to live for Christ and follow Him and serve Him. And I don't want to fool anybody here. I don't want to mislead anybody. It's not easy to be a real born-again Christian in 1984. It's hard. And I don't want you to come under any illusions. If you come to Christ, you mean it. And say, I'm willing to let him come in and change me and make me a new person. Because he said, if you're not willing to deny self, take up a cross, you cannot be my follower. And that's the reason he didn't commit himself to that crowd of people. They said, we want to believe. We want you, Jesus. He said, no, I know your heart. You're not willing to surrender your heart to me. You're not ready to surrender your mind and your emotions and your whole being to me, your body, your business, your vocation. You're not willing to surrender the bitterness in your life. You're not ready to surrender that unforgiving spirit. You're not ready to surrender those things that are wrong. I'm going to ask those of you tonight, hundreds of you, we've seen over 3,000 every night come. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand on this matting. We don't want to touch the grass because we have promised that we will not touch this beautiful grass come and stand on the matting and you're coming to stand there symbolically saying inwardly that you're opening your heart to Christ you want a new life you want to be a new person like you've heard here tonight why do I ask you to come because every person that Jesus ever called he called publicly he said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. He hung on the cross openly in front of a howling mob of people for you. Now you come and stand in this beautiful Anfield Stadium to declare yourself for him. From all over the stadium, just get up and come and stand here and say tonight, I want Christ in my heart. I want him in my life, and I'm willing to surrender my life to him. Quickly, hundreds of you, get up and come. As you see the thousands responding here at the stadium tonight, so the Spirit of God is speaking to many of you. Perhaps you'd like to talk to someone right now. A counselor is standing by, ready to talk with you about your need, about your spiritual problem. Call the number that's on your screen. If the line is busy, just wait a